my passion now, this finding these incredible women. And uh, how many people here know about uh, Volta, Alessandro Volta? He was a mentee of Laura Bassi. Galvani is very, very famous, but he was also a mentee and uh, much younger. And she published more papers than he did. But who knows that, right? Okay, so I wrote this book, and I went to Bologna, learned Italian. I was really wanting to do it properly. So with gloves, I saw 300-year-old documents. It really got to me. She lived in my heart and in my head for a year and a half. This particular period in the 1700s was unique in the whole world. Not anywhere else in the world, and not after, but that hundred years of the 1700s. Laura was debating in her house with a very important man. Now, usually only noble women were able to get that level of education and salons and everything. But in her case, she was a prodigy and so amazing that even the future pope, Cardinal Lambertini, came to her salon and some of the academicians and everything. In uh, March 20 of that year, they made her a member of the Academy of Science of Bologna because they were so impressed with her. But uh, mind you, they thought it was an honorary thing. So on April 17, she defended 49 theses. Well, it's not like our current students. The theses were scientific questions or questions of philosophy. So really, it was not like the thesis that we know today, because 49 would be kind of impossible. So she was a physicist at heart. And they gave her a doctorate of philosophy on May 12, but more her interest was in science. And then she defended 12 more theses. Now, she had a fight with her teacher at that point, because he wanted her to do it on ethics, and she wanted to do it on physics. And he got really upset. So she did it on physics, and uh, I think the Pope called him a, a pretty silly man uh, to impose that on her, and so she, uh, she was defended by, by some very important men. Now, the reason they did the extra 12 in June is so that she could get a lectureship at the university, and it worked. But then again, was it a real job or not? So she gave her a lecture. You know, we still do that today, right? Before we get hired, we give a lecture at the university. So she did that. On October 20, same year, she's very, very young. She's about 20. And then she got a paid lectureship, though. They paid her a salary, 500 lira per year, which wasn't bad. That's what other people got. Usually a thesis was a few, you know, the student and a few professors, and that was it. But in her case, they wanted something very, very public. So you can see there now, this is a miniature made by an artist after the fact. And then the same with her degree. Everything was so public. Everybody was there. And they had her in a carriage crossing Bologna, and people, like a princess, you know, was waving to her, and she's waving to people. And then the same with her degree. Everything was so public, the real thing. Now, this is interesting. This is when they, December, they had, uh, every December, they had a kind of a carnival. Doctors would do um, anatomy lectures with dead prisoners, people who were hanged or something. They would dissect them, and then they had some very famous lectures by professors. And that's where they wanted Laura Bassi to teach. You're not going to teach our young men in their classes. You're going to come when we ask you to come, and you're going to perform. So that was her job. People used to drink wine, and, and you know, it was a real party. Why did they do this with Laura? So the city of Bologna and its university were in serious decline. They needed a successful and extraordinary event, so you're starting to see now why the big performance. So they chose someone who could not fail, because imagine, if it failed, it would be worse. They would go down again. So her position, although it was paid, was honorary, and she wasn't supposed to act on it. Support from powerful men, as I said, the Pope Benedict XIV and his secretary in Rome, Flaminio Scarcelli, a very important man in the future, how she turned honorary to real. And that's why I thought she was so extraordinary. Now, between 32 and 45, she was forced into doing literary works. And she would have to write sonnets and things like that. So, and she hated it. She, although they're very good, somebody said in the discussions about her. But she hated it. She wanted to do science. So she had a mathematician, Manfredi, to teach her um, about Newton. And she's the first woman who brought Newton, actually, you'll see in a minute, um, to Italy. 
Now, something happened in 1745, which has totally, totally changed her life. Because in 45, the Pope Benedict, he created the Benedettina, which was 24 men who would be in the Science Academy. 10 would have been the heads of the different departments, and they would choose the next 14. And her husband was chosen, and she was shocked. She wasn't on the list. So she wrote to Flaminio, and all the letters are in there in the book. But she wrote to, you know, can the Pope help me because that's his Benedictina, he created it. I don't want to take the place of a man because nobody's going to digest that, right? So why don't you put another position, like just add one? So he did. So they were now 25, and she was in it. Well, they were getting 100 lira per year, and every year they had to present at the academy some original work. And they had to deposit in Latin, and of course she was fluent in seven languages. So she deposited in, in uh, all her papers every year, right? So now they couldn't stop her from presenting, see? So now she's doing the real stuff. And then they were trying very hard to get her to teach real classes. But that wasn't happening very, very fast. Also, Napoleon was invading at the time. The Spanish Wars as well. It was a terrible time. Sometimes the university was closed down for many, many years. And the city of Bologna was controlled by the invaders. So it was a difficult time. Um, but you'll see what she did. So she teaches experimental physics to students and foreigners and local men and academicians who come to her house. Now, some men who wrote about her in history book said, oh, she was only teaching at her home, so like it's not important. But I found out, and I say in there, many, many men were doing this. They were supplementing their classes at university with their classes at home. They all were doing it. So some men were very, very derogatory to her. That's why I'm really glad I wrote the book, because you got to erase those things. So anyway, she taught, and then they propagated um, Newton's ideas and theories in Italy. And she did original work every year, in spite of the fact that she had 12 pregnancies, nine deliveries, and five who grew up to being adults, children. But every year, and she had difficult pregnancies, difficult births, and yet she presented her original work every year, which I find totally amazing. So there's a medal also that was done by an artist after uh, her uh, doctorate, and uh, it's at the Archigynesio, which is a library which has all her documents. She was like a, like a hub. So people asked her to connect them with the academy, and people in the academy would ask her to connect with people. So she was like a hub. You know, that's, women are very good at that. So she had a very important role in this sense. And uh, this is uh, her cousin, a young cousin, Spallanzani, and he was a biologist. He asked her to do some experiments because uh, he was cutting little uh, heads of salamanders and things, and, and he said, you know, it's going to grow again. You know the regeneration that we do so much today? Well, he was starting this, and, um, and he's a scientist because of her. He, she was a mentor, and uh, she guided his studies. And of course, he was an admirer. Volta wrote to her letters and said, what do you think of my new uh, article, my new book? Uh, uh, you know, does it make sense and all that? So imagine, right? And everybody thinks Volta is really, well, he is, but Laura Bassi was even more um, admirable. So other admirers is the Pope, of course, and Volta. Volta said, you know, I'm in the academy in England, you know, the Royal Academy, but even though there's a Newton there, I'd rather be in the Academy of Bologna because there's a Laura Bassi there. Valdar said that, you know, it's quite amazing. The detractors, there were many members still at the Academy upset when she went. They tried to stop the voting of her in when she was chosen by the Pope even. And the Pope said, um, well, what's your problem, you know? So they had to answer to the Pope, so they kind of shut up, you know? <laughs> so, so she got in, but it was hard. And the administrators, they kept, you know, saying, well, we don't want to give her a real job. But at the end of the day, when she got her chair, which is a full professorship, uh, 76, um, she was uh, given uh, 1,200 lira per year, which was more than most other professors and the same as the president of the university. I conclude that Italy was unique for about 100 years. 
Laura died, unfortunately, very suddenly. Her laboratory instruments is a very sad story I tell in there about how it all disappeared. I would love to see Laura Bassi's equipment. So when, I think I would like to buy a plaque and put it outside with Galvani's, just maybe on top. <laughs> and then, you know, do something. And I don't know how, if people maybe make a project of a chapel for her, but I think she deserves it. Now, Gabriella Bertilogan, uh, she studied science at the University of Ottawa, undergrad. She did some incredible work. She had master's and PhD. I was given her thesis by her professor, Beatrice uh, Craig, and uh, had discussions with her, and it gave me so much information. And then she died of cancer in 2009, and I dedicated the book to her. I wanted her to be remembered, and I explain in the book why. So, thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.